tardes. Eh, tengo el placer de presentar al siguiente ponente. Tina Gargent is a Slovenian multidisciplinary stage designer who is recognized for her work, which merges the practice as a product and stage design with biotechnology procedures. She believes the future for creative fields is absolutely linked to biology, which is why she is fascinated by biotechnology and its potential to shape the future. She is most widely recognized for her work, which merges the practices of speculative and critical product design with scientific procedures. Her work has caught the attention of some of the biggest media companies, including The Guardian, The New York Times, Disney, Motherboard, and Turntable. She was also featured in the TV series produced by the TV network Arte which is devoted to emerging times in innovative design field. Tina is currently working on commissions for several galleries and private organizations, as well as being an educator and writer for educational institutions. She is also a contributing writer for Club Magazine. Please welcome to Tina Gertrude. Firstly, thank you so much for battling this food coma with me <laughs> after such a good lunch. And I really appreciate you coming in such a vast number to this, so thank you so much. Thank you also to the organizers who invited me to do this talk. So, as my really nice and uh, extensive introduction was here just before me, like I, am, I categorize myself as an interdisciplinary designer but I also get regarded as a critical or speculative designer. And I was asked today to talk about the first principle of uh, what good design means to dietary ranks. And while I was reading through it, I was, I was getting quite excited because it touches upon one of the key elements that I tried to implement within my practice, which is the notion that design and technology and science should, should really uh, communicate with each other and keep pace with each other the whole time. However, how I like to define my practice uh, is as design for debate rather than the most widely spread practices of design which kind of tend to be more commercial. And the reason uh, for that is because I tend to look at my so-called users or audience more as citizen rather than a consumer. So the tools I end up developing or the products I end up developing are not for commercial purposes, but rather acts as tools that initiate a debate and bridges the gap between different poles of our cultural spectrum. So when I was trying to make sense of uh, how dietary rames defined what good innova innovative design means to, I ended up producing six what I've called sub-principles within which I frame my practice. And I tend to apply all of them across my, the whole spectrum of my work, which also includes consulting, talks, and educating. And I will go through them in more detail throughout this presentation, although for, in, in order to keep time, I will just present three projects and then in that, to, in each project present two of the principles. So, in my opinion, and framing my practice, good innovation design has to have a sustainable agenda. And what I mean by that is that the designer has to investigate the impact that the design output can have prior to introducing his output into the commercial market, or in my case, into our society, and direct his work accordingly prior to implementing his own product. A good innovative design also unsettles the present. So the designer have to, has to design outputs that are not confined to limitations set out by our human behaviors and are aimed at challenging either assumptions and givens about our ro the role that products play in our everyday life, as well as promote new assumptions and new givens that are at odds with the one we are accustomed today. And those 
two principles really become apparent within the first project I'm going to talk about, which is probably my most known project, and it's called the Pure Human Project. Within this project, I speculated on a possible formation or of a fictional luxury leather brand. And this leather brand will be producing a bio-grown leather-like material which would be derived from human cells. It will be embedding human genetic information within this material and then produce products out of it. And because of the legal uh, loopholes that we currently have that should be protecting our uh, genetic information but fail to do so, this company would have full legal ownership over the use and distribution of those products. So my speculative process upon which the Pure Human Project is based on combines different types of technologies that are already present in laboratories around the globe although up until now they have never joined forces and combined those technologies in order to perform such, uh, to form such a product. So the first technology that it utilizes has its roots in synthetic biology and it's called de-extinction. The second is one of the uh, branches of biotechnology, which is called tissue engineering technologies. And the third one will be combining all of those procedures with standard leather tanning techniques, which are already present in our luxury market today. I ended up by uh, producing three uh, speculative pr uh, products that sit within my scenario and as you might notice they are all designed in such matter so that their surface uh, mimics the alteration the human skin undergoes in the cycle of its lifetime. So if you look at it the jacket is tattooed, the uh, backpack has freckles and moles as well as the bags it's really liable to tanning because of the fragility of the skin. The reason for doing that was essentially to humanize back the dehumanized product, so to show, shine a light over what, is, what would be actually the core source of the products, which usually get so detached, for, which usually we detach from our mentality when we look at leather products. Within the project, I also filed for a patent application that, if granted, will get me full ownership over a leather-like material that will be embedded with genetic information of, from someone else. So essentially, in a wider spectrum, it will, all, uh, it will enable me to own a part of someone else. And the reason for doing that is to showcase that even though this project, as I mentioned, is purely speculative, it is still set in uh, the parameters of our current actual legal structure. So besides that the Pure Human Project aim to expose loopholes that are present in the legislation that should be protecting genetic information but fail to do so and therefore enable companies to get ownership over our genetic material. It also aimed to showcase a possible use of the biotechnologies which were at the time when the project was conceived still very much linked to the field of pharmaceuticals and med medicine. And as you might expect, it created a media outrage and it, uh, the project got actually quite sensationalized and it was promoted as a commercial product, project, even though it was never said to be so. A good portion of obviously the credits for it being spread so uh, worldwide is the fact that it was speculating on the possible use of uh, Alexander McQueen's DNA, which will be embedded in the material itself. The reason for doing that is, was because at that time, that was one of the really rarely source of genetic material that you could actually verify and uh, found out that it was fr uh, der deriving from himself. And as you can imagine, the outrage from the public when the project was firstly launched was actually huge. Those are just some of my favorite that I received from different media outlets. <laughs> However, what was even more fascinating for me was the fact that the mentality of the general population shifted so quickly. So in a time frame of about two weeks, I believe, after the initial shock factor wear off, I could see how 
people were start, were starting to draw away from that, sh uh, from that shocking nature of the project and actually embracing other aspects of it that were previously uh, fully that were previously fully hidden by the media so the ethical implication it tackles or, as well as the sustainable agenda it actually has be behind it and even more interestingly, it generated new stakeholders. So companies that previously were totally against the technology and wanted nothing to do with it, started to get interested because they could see how they can apply to their own personal agenda. So I would say that the reason why I think the project actually reached its goal, so it became so successful, was mainly to, due to the fact that it was showcased a problem which is so complex in nature and so detached from our everyday life throughout a media that it's commonly used, more, uh, more understandable and relatable to every one of us, which is the medium of luxury uh, brands. And to keep time, let's go to the third and the fourth principles, which are that, in my opinion, good innovative design can be dark. And by that, I mean that dark design uh, outputs can promote the positive use of creativity. So they can speculate on a, spec, uh, on a scenario that purposely challenges the ethical boundaries of the mainstream. And if successful, they can stimulate the uh, viewers to make up their own mind about the topics they're trying to expose. Good innovative design can also be critical. So the designers that uh, uses this methodology has to think about current law, political systems, social beliefs, ethics, values, fears and hopes, and project them, and project them uh, so they can be translated into future material expression and embody into our material culture. And a good example of those two principles, I would say, is my phylogenetic atelier project, which was a project that was, derived, uh, that was developed in the collaboration with an institution that is called Revive and Restore, which is based in California. And in a really clear explanation, what this, what this um, institution does is essentially a real-life Jurassic Park. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to exti de extinct extinct animal species. So they're trying to bring back animal species that haven't uh, walked the face of the earth for approximately 100 to 150 years or even older. We decided that we will base the core of the uh, project upon their research project, which is called the Great Passenger Pigeon Comeback Project, which, as the name suggests, is trying to bring back the passenger pigeon, a bird that lives its native to the northern American forest line and has been extinct for over 150 years. The reason why we decided to base research, uh, uh, the research of the phylogenetic atelier project specifically upon this project was because it is their pilot project as well as it represents the base project upon which most of the de extinction research is based upon not just within the institution but worldwide. And the second reason was uh, because when the company started to share information with me I got their timesheet which was essentially mapping out the goals that they have already achieved and the goals they are aiming to achieve within the future. And as you can see, it is it's going to happen quite quickly because the day extinction, when they mark the starting of the day extinction process, is within a year and the soft release is planned to be by 2030. And soft re release literally means having the actual bird in the laboratory confinement. So having a bird that was extinct for 150 years beforehand in the laboratory. So my job role in terms of the whole project was to speculate far beyond the research application that they currently have and showcase how it could potentially apply onto the commercial market. I decided to again use the medium of leather because I felt that that was again the perfect platform to kind of like initiate this problematic debate that is happening all around the world with the extinction procedures on a much more understandable and scalable level. 
So the product that I showcase essentially face the same product that the whole species will, have, uh, will face in general, which is that we have to realize then while bringing back extinct materials and extinct animals, we are essentially producing a fake copy of something that already existed. And by producing so, we are categorizing them legally speaking, as synthetic copies. And that allows companies or individuals to claim ownership over that. So essentially you are, again, able to own a part of nature. And this really kind of elevates this question that I think is quite burning when it, when it, and it applies to all biotechnological procedures around the globe. So if we are able to just purely tweak with nature, the extinct nature, does it diminish the value we hold towards it? And lastly, to speak about the fifth and the sixth principle, like sub-principle that I derived from the, main, uh, from the main definition, it's, in my opinion, good innovation design speculates, as you might figure. <laughs> so the, um, the speculative design output are assessed by me by how well they sit between the here and now and the yet to be world. Go the good innovation design also democratizes technological changes, which means that it recognizes the paradox between citizens and as well as consumers, which goes by that that we, as a member of, of the public, tend to debate issues as citizens, but we really might shape our reality as consumers. And what it aims to do in that sector is to bridge the gap between expert knowledge on one side, as well as the um, uh, concerns of the public on the other side, and make both sides really engage in a debate that is shaping our technological and scientific futures. Those two principles are the core principles upon which my newest project was developed. And it is called the Self-Donor Workshop Project and was commissioned by the Science uh, Gallery London. And it was also part of their spare part exhibitions. The project aims at speculating a possible future job role, which I call the organ tailor. And it aims to combine together different practices, so a medical biotechnological practice, a medical environment, as well as a made-to-measure tailoring workshop. It's also set on the much advertised notion that, uh, from the media that we are going to be able to 3D print or at least grow whole human organs in our near future. And as this notion is usually projected in such a utopian way, I quite, while talking to experts, I quite saw the other side and the other concern that they might have when this is happening. So the overabundance of it will also produce um, like attraction between the institutions which are all competing in the race to get patients. And this is this is kind of brewing a good environment for what I called the commercialization of human flesh. When you will be seeing products that will be uh, biologically made and that will be embedded into your own body rather than just surrounding it. However, it's fair to say that quite quickly while talking to experts and scientists from King's College London, I got informed about the idea that even though the mass media portrays that those type of complex tissues will be available quite soon within the market, this is actually not the reality in a laboratory environment. As a matter of fact, this technology is still very much in its infant stages at this point. However, where most of the research institutions are currently pointing their interest in is in producing mini organs which are organs that are essentially a narrow, streamed down, uh, simplified version of the original organ. They might be applied to the, uh, to the original organ or merged together with it, and they, are, um, they would take over just one of the functions of the failing organ or alleviate symptoms for a patient, depending on their usage. 
how I showcased this new uh, research that I was involved in was essentially to create what I called a top-up kit ma made out of seven different mini organs that can be easily assembled and they fit perfectly onto the most mass-produced uh, 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 tor um, medical torso model, which is currently in use in most educational systems today. And how they fit on top of the already made organs is exactly how they would fit based on the research data that the research um, institutions have provided me with. And this mass production and general education of uh, people, uh, of the general public when it comes to those new technologies fits perfectly into the narrative or essentially fits perfectly into the problematic that is emerging with those research institutions when where they're trying to grow in those type of mini organs, the, regul the regulatory system set in place very much aimed for a standardization of procedure and standardization of based material with essentially produce cookie cutters mini organs that act completely in contrast with the individu individuality and a special characteristic of each one of our human bodies. So this is just some of my works that I, uh, that I do. And there should be a website, but it's not, OK. But if you're very welcome to check out my website for more information or either see more of my project. And thank you so much for your attention.